Hello, Blunders, and welcome. Welcome to episode number 299 of Real Blend, a podcast that wants to know, Kevin specifically, if you know Denis Villeneuve's favorite 1997 British musical comedy starring Alan a... Cummings, George Went, and Roger Moore. Denis so... Villeneuve has a very specific, beloved 1997 British musical comedy. He's been talking about it the entire Dune tour, uh, press tour. It's, it's true. He brings it up on every more interview. More than Dune. He talks about it's, it more than Dune. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Part two is great, but but have you seen? It co-stars Alan Cumming, George Went of Cheers fame, and Sir Roger Moore, former James Bond. I have absolutely no idea. Jakey, any idea? I, I am Sp- ready for this punchline, baby. Spice World. <laughs> Spice World. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, the way you went around not naming I can't the mention Spice them. Girls, like, if like I <laughs> name them, it gives it away. Also, is, is Spice World a musical? Yeah. Oh, very I much so. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I remember the I, Spice I, I, World. I've never seen it. Do you know what I remember the most oh, about Spice World? I, I, I saw it at AMC Patrick Henry 7. Isn't there a scene where a bus, like, like they, they they cut to like a miniature bus like jumping over like a bridge or like a water. I'll never forget. Yeah. The director calls <laughs> it his sandworm scene. That's how he remembers <laughs> it. <laughs> his Batmobile scene. <laughs> and it looks about as accurate as the ambulance jumping out of the Times Square oh. billboard in Madam Web. <laughs> Right. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Right, right, right. Also had 1997 special effects. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, 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 hey. Spice World. That's pretty funny, actually. Spice I, I World. wish. Come I on. just didn't know where you were going with that. I don't remember I any. Uh, I don't remember Roger Moore being in that movie. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> this episode brought to you by Spice, Spice World. World. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Sean O'Connell, uh, the managing editor of Cinema Blend and a co host of the Roblin podcast. And on this week's show, One of our favorite directors is going to be taking over the Jurassic Park franchise, uh, and we're going to talk about whether that has gotten us excited or not. And our guest is Jonathan Glazer, who joins the show to discuss his Oscar hopeful film, The Zone of Interest. I'm joined this week, as I am every single week, by Spice Girls fanatic Kev McCarthy (laughs) of Fox 5 in Washington, D.C. Hi, Kev. How are you? Hi. Um, I'm doing good. I, I just uh, I, I know everyone's tired of hearing me talk about Nolan, but um, I do just want to say I'm excited for the tenant reissue this weekend. Uh, you got if, tickets? If you, work, do you have tickets? Oh, definitely. I'm going on. I think I'm, I'm going on Tuesday. Sean, he's um, already okay. he's already seen it. He's already got tickets. That's it's true. already yeah. happened. It, it happened. already happened. happened. He's seeing it for the um, first time this weekend. Yeah. 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 Dude, that actually would be a really cool, that'd be a cool segment for Real Blend. I just want to put it out there. Like we should do a segment about a movie you'd love to see again for the first time. If you could I think erase. we talked about that. We talked about Did that we? a lot. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe um, on a premium, maybe on a premium. Kev, what happens yeah. if I don't understand Tenet though? You know, you know, don't try to understand it. Feel it, Sean. I've Thank been trying to explain much. that. All right, so I will say this. <laughs> so, so for people out there listening, uh, we did have Christopher Nolan on our show for Tenet back in 2020 with John David Washington. We also had Christopher Nolan on for Oppenheimer. Um, if you never got a chance to see Tenet in theaters, it is back in IMAX. Um, it was out during the pandemic, so there were a lot of people who didn't get a chance to see it in theaters. Um, I highly recommend it. It's an incredible film. And as I said, don't try to understand it. Feel it. People try to understand every aspect of that movie. You don't need to. Just enjoy it. Yeah. And then on your on fifth IMAX. rewatch, you'll understand. Yeah, I've seen it you like 15 times. That. Subtitles help. <laughs> uh, that's Jake Hamilton of Fox 32 in Chicago with the beautiful city of Chicago behind him. This is the reason why you should watch this on the YouTube channel. Hi, Jakey. How are you? You had one job to do, Sean, and that yes. was wear a maroon suit. Yeah, mm. I know. No one, no one loops me in on yeah. the fashion hey, conversation you don't have beforehand. to be looped in. Just feel it. Just feel yeah, it. <laughs> exactly. We're the, Jake and I, Jake and I are, uh, Adam Levine took over. We're Maroon 2. We're Maroon 2. Yeah, yeah. The other Not quite as good. Not quite. Not I would like to know. Shit, for, uh, that's a better joke and, than my our, Spice World joke. Um, our uh, listeners are so good at doing this kind of thing. I'd like them to label uh, which of us would be which Spice Girl. Oh, Ooh. interesting. Okay. How many Spice Girls I, I, are there? I, I think there's five. Four. Is there five? five? Well, one's, one's going to be left over. Yeah, I, I couldn't name them if you asked me to. The fifth Spice Girl is the audience at home. Yeah, I always love whenever we, we throw those challenges out there. We always get like the most interesting <laughs> answers. That's true. Very true. I'm probably Baby Spice. I don't really know. <laughs> I have no. I have no idea, dude. I, I was telling someone this today. It's so weird. You brought up Spice World. 
Um, we are I, still I, talking I, about this is a I lot. See, I want to see I, this transition. You guys don't know this, but Kevin has a tattoo on his lower back that says Spice Boy. <laughs> He's been Boy. waiting for almost 300 episodes <laughs> yeah. for someone to bring up Spice World. Well, there's Baby Spice, Ginger Spice, Sporty posh, Spice, uh, Sporty, Sporty posh, Spice, Posh Spice. spice. And, uh, did you say baby spice? Scary? Yeah. Scary, scary spice. spice. That's what is it really we scary did it. spice. We did it. Did it, guys. it took us 299 episodes. <laughs> but we got all five spice girls. Uh, you can find us on social media at Sean underscore O'Connell. <laughs> I'm actually not joking. Earlier today, about an hour and a half ago, I was talking to someone in my newsroom because Sean and, or Jake and I both interviewed Mark Wahlberg yesterday for Arthur the King. And years ago, I don't remember the name of the hotel. I was in London for one of the Transformers films. And the hotel that the interviews were happening in was the same hotel where the Spice Girls shot their famous music video for um, whatever their big. I can't remember the name of the huge song they have. If it was you like want to be biggest, my lover. I think it was. But whatever video it was, it was a very big deal at the time. I'll never forget it. Mark Wahlberg was walking around the hotel. It was me and a bunch of other journalists. And then Mark Wahlberg allowed us to shoot a video on the same steps the Spice Girls shot the video and he directed it and shot it. It's oh, like I one remember of the great, seeing this video. I, I need to find a link. I'll, I'll send it to Gabe if I can find it and we'll put it if he wants to in the YouTube thing here to that's click on it. But it, it was ridiculous. Yeah, that's yeah. bizarre. Yeah. Everything <laughs> comes full circle. <laughs> Everything um, comes full circle to Spice World. Yes. Hello. If you're watching us on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for sticking uh, with us. We should yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hit subscribe. Yeah. Turn on your notifications. Um, head to the comments. Let us know where you're listening from. Let us know your favorite Spice Girl. Um, and share the show uh, with a friend, a movie-loving friend. We are, as I mentioned last week, over 17,000 subscribers. Blows my mind. That's we pretty cool. We're fast approaching episode 300. I mean, we've grown this little, this little baby since... Our little uh, show. Awards Bund. I don't know if you guys know this, but we started as an awards podcast <laughs> named I, Awards Bund. Doesn't sound familiar. Yeah, it doesn't no. sound familiar at all. <laughs> uh, go to youtube.com backslash Real Blend Podcast. Of course, we're available all the different places where your podcast needs are met. You can also sign up for Real Blend Premium. It gets you an ad-free version of the show, a newsletter from me every other Friday. So check the description for information on where to sign up. Okay, so... Yes, well, I'm joking saying that we used to be an awards podcast, but we are very heavily into the uh, Oscar race. We're going to be doing a lot of stuff for the Academy Awards as they approach. And we are thrilled to have uh, Best Director nominated, uh, Best Director nominee, Jonathan Glazer, um, who has made a number of incredible films, including the film that he is joining our show to talk about, The Zone of Interest. And likely going to uh, be, can we, I know we're not doing Oscar prediction just yet, but this is going to win international feature. Like he's going to win an Oscar on March 10th. Is that, so it's Zone of Interest and Anatomy of a Fall? No, Anatomy, Anatomy, of, a Anatomy fall? of a Fall was not uh, the, the country's chosen movie. Oh, that's I mean, talk about, talk about fumbling an Oscar. Wow. Yeah, so it's, so it's easily going to be Zone of Interest. Okay, interesting. I, in my um, opinion, that's just my that's I'm giving an, an early Oscar prediction. But uh, those, those are, are coming those, soon, I mean, folks. Yeah, but uh, I I would I would predict that our, our guest today is about to have an Oscar in his hand on March 10th. I don't so, say this I don't say this lightly, but the Zone of Interest, which we're going to review on the other side of this interview, is one of the greatest films I have ever seen in my life. Like I have never seen anything, and, and you'll see here in the interview. Uh, like it, I'll never see it again because it, it, it's just it's so it echoes in me for I think forever now I'm imagining I've saw it four and a half weeks ago and I can't stop thinking about it um, this is a, a, a an extraordinary uh, filmmaking movie in terms of the way this movie was made but also the feeling that it gives you it's horrifying and disturbing but we'll dive into it in the interview and the review later but I just wanted to say that up front because if you have any you know if you're questioning whether or not you want to watch this film because of the subject matter I do recommend seeing it. It's just a very tough watch. And, and Jonathan's going to explain that in the interview. Well, then I will let him do that. And here's Jonathan Glazer joining the Real Blend podcast on behalf of Zone of Interest. Well, I'm going to jump into this. Um, and I really kind of wanted to just sort of uh, timestamp this moment because it's pretty cool that we're getting the chance to chat with you the day after the BAFTAs where the film uh, won multiple well-deserved awards. Uh, and I obviously, I know you don't make movies for award shows, but I am sort of curious what hearing your name, what hearing, you know, your incredible sound department, getting that sort of confirmation of your efforts. What does that mean to you and how does it sort of affect your relationship with the movie and, and what has today been like? 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, it is certainly it was certainly a surprise um, to get you know I, I'm always I'm always surprised that uh, people are interested to be frank. Um, so it's always great when that translates into nominations and even more uh, 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 unexpected, really that it that that then becomes they you know that we win some of them. Um, it's obviously fantastic for the film. So my relationship with awards are, is is um, is about the fact that it it encourages people to see the film full stop. You know that that's the great thing about it. Um, I have my own personal um, insecurities when it comes to moments like those, but uh, you know you just got to take a deep breath and and uh, and get on with it. But the 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 effect it has on the film is is, is enormous. Yeah. John, I was in LA about a month ago and I, I was just, I had a few hours, I had some time to kill during the day and I was looking up theater show times and Vista was playing a 35 millimeter engagement of your movie. And I actually still have my ticket from that day because I actually, oh, I bought two tickets, even though I was by myself, because I wanted to have one that I didn't tear because I'd never been to that Vista before. And obviously I know Quentin Tarantino owns that theater now. Um, mm -hmm. But since I saw that film, your movie has been echoing in my mind. It's been haunting me in in, in a way that I can't even uh, describe. I've never seen anything like it before. And for four weeks, I've been texting the guys saying, this movie has not left me. This movie is still echoing in my mind. I think about it constantly. Um, so because your film did that to me, I want to know films that have done that to you, films that have echoed in your mind for a long period of time after seeing it, something that was uh, just films that kind of that you think about like that. Well, I mean, th thank you. First of all, thank you for seeing it. And uh, I'm pleased you you got to see it there. Um, uh, um, uh, films. I mean, there's many films. I'm just going to go through the ones that occur to me as you as you said it, um, for different reasons. Um, there's a uh, Iranian film, a short 20 minute Iranian film called The House Is Black, which is about a which was made in the 1960s by a, by a by a female Iranian poet who, uh, and it's an absolutely remarkable film, possibly certainly one of the, my my favorite films, um, or one of the films that I carry with me. Um, and that was a story about um that was simply a um. A, a leper is about a leper colony in the 1960s in Iran. It's made with such a, a extraordinary kind of um, clarity and, fe and and fearlessness, a sort of an, unfin an unflinching uh, look um, that is so humanizing. You know, um, it's that's a fantastic film that stays with me. Um, it, in the, the darker end of things. Um, um, Salo, obviously, the, the Pasolini film, which is uh, you know, I've seen once and I'd never want to see again, but I've never stopped, you know, it's never been far from my mind. Um uh my goodness. Um Virgin Spring, Bergman, um lots of films. My I don't know where to start. It's like, you know. No, no worries. I'll just jump in real fast because there's something you said there in your answer that I think is interesting. Uh, I've I was telling the guys this too. Like, because you just said it, and I wanted to say it to you. I don't know that I ever want to sit through the movie again, but it's one of the best films I've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> so it's like, and I just wonder, do you take that as a compliment if someone says that? Because like, I, I just, I, it's been, I don't need to see it again. I, I'm living it yeah. in my mind since I've yeah. seen it. You know, well, I mean, it's, it's you know, we we all absorb films differently, don't we? And I think um, some people have seen the film multiple times because there are obviously there are there are layers to it, which I hope. Uh, will be um clearer on second third fourth viewing but but the uh the intention of the film is absolutely a, vi a visceral one it's it's definitely a film which was made to elicit a kind of a physical response almost um almost that it gives you something so you, it gives you such a it gives you a feeling in your stomach that is almost like yeah. it's almost like I, i'm gonna put off anybody who wants to go to the cinema now but it's almost like it's almost like a stomach cramp it's almost like if i eat that again i will get that feeling so therefore i won't eat it again so in that sense just physical point of view it's uh it's um i think it's a powerful experience mm. well this yeah. it, i think serves as a perfect follow-up to that because uh, i'm talking to you from chicago kevin's talking to you from dc and the film was in the chicago international film festival uh, just a couple of months ago and so christian uh who is absolutely phenomenal in the film was actually here in my studio with me for a for a sit down sort of long form conversation about the film and one of the things he did tell me was that more than any character he's ever played it took him i think he i want to say he said years for him to be able to sort of shake 
uh, this experience and, and, and really kind of get past uh, the places he had to go. But I am sort of curious as sort of the the man who crafted this story and who, you know, spent so much time putting it together. If, you know, we we talk about the, the films haunting us, your actors talking about the films haunting haunting them. Does it haunt you in the same way? Like whenever the, whenever you're done with it and, and you've got, you know, final cut of the film and it's in theaters and it's doing its thing. Do you, do you still feel like you've got to kind of work to detach yourself from it? Or are you too close in a way to have those kind of feelings toward it? Um, that's a good question. I, I, I am still processing it for myself. Mm -hmm. So because obviously I've been on a long journey with this um, from the beginning. Uh, and I've been thinking about little else. Um, and so it's occupied so much of my time and my thoughts um that it, it's it's impossible to just sort of detach yourself from it and put it away it is uh it'll be with me forever really but it's a but i'm finding the uh i'm finding i think when we get beyond the oscars which will be the last my last responsibility to this film certainly uh in the short term um then i feel like i will be able to actually finally begin to actually process the 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 uh the experience of making it the journey i've been on to make it um, but yeah, I've lost a lot of sleep making it and, uh, I think it would be, I would be worried if I didn't, you know, I'd, I'd feel like I've, I've tried to take something on that I didn't, I didn't take seriously enough or something, or it didn't affect me enough. And if it, was, if it wasn't going to affect me enough, I couldn't expect it to affect a viewer, you know, I had to, uh, yeah. to do it to myself first, you know, this is a stupid mm -hmm. question, but just as a follow up, what, what does it mean? for a filmmaker to process his own film. Like I know what it means as a film fan to process someone else's work. I'm sort of curious what it means for you to process your film. Mm. Well, I mean, for me to process a film, I mean, when I've finished a film, I don't ever look at it again. So I've never seen anything I've made after I've finished it. You're missing uh, out. They're really great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I just, I just, I, I find it really difficult to look back. You know, I don't want to look back. I want to keep sort of looking forward. I'm sure most filmmakers would agree with that. But it's a, um, you process it in different ways. It's not a, this particular film, I think, um, is going to take a lot longer for obvious reasons, the subject matter and the, uh, um, and the atmosphere of the film. Um, but I think it's, um, it's about, for me, it's about, um, almost feeling having this period of time between finishing something and starting something else. Like I'm very much like that. I don't overlap my projects. I'm clearly, I, I do one, I commit fully to something for as long as it takes to achieve it. And then, and then once it's achieved, I, there's this beautiful sweet spot of, uh, almost like peace of like the thing I've made is no longer, uh, asking anything of me. And the next thing I might make hasn't yet tapped itself, tapped on my shoulder and said, you know, that's the that will be the next thing I I venture into. So it's a it's a it's a sort of fallow period, and it's I, I love it. It's like uh, you know I can read a book and fall asleep. I can uh, take my wife out for dinner. You know I can go and see some friends, go to a football game that I wasn't able to go to, and you know just do things like that, just life stuff without this kind of the the burden of this uh, in this sort of artistic investigation that that's always on me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So processing for me is a period of I need that space between two things, really. Sure. You know, John, we we as Jake said, we created this show because we want to we want to educate our audience on how films are made. And I think this is one of the greatest films I've personally ever seen, just from purely from a filmmaking standpoint, the what it's done for me as an audience member, the immersion level, as I mentioned, I saw it at the Vista. So that sound design was absolutely incredible to kind of hear it in that theater. But you have a, a quote that you've said in a couple of the featurettes, which is you wanted to create a present tense as an experience. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's such a brilliant way to approach this because we're, it's not like we're going back in time. We're supposed to be there in that moment. Um, mm. And the utilizing of the cameras and hiding the cameras in the house or having some visible and some hidden, uh, I, I'm just curious if you can just walk our audience through that process. I mean, for people who, are, who haven't seen the behind the scenes footage, you're like sitting in, a, in an area with and looking at all the cameras and all the visuals that you have. Can you just explain that process of placing cameras and kind of creating that present tense? Certainly. I mean, the, the the idea of the present tense was because I didn't want to make it like it was something which was 80 years ago and we could all feel safely removed from. Mm. Um, so I wanted everything to be to be shot as if, you know, we were looking at it through a 21st century lens, really. 
um, or with it. In fact, we were looking at everything to a 21st century lens. So I was, so I absolutely embraced the most modern, sharpest technology that would uh, be part of um, the technology I would need to uh, service that that idea. Um, so uh, how we achieved part of it was by setting up a system involving 10 cameras. <clears throat> Those 10 cameras would be positioned in different rooms depending on which action we were going to film that day. Obviously, I would be blocking the action with the actors and then uh, and then setting the cameras or, or, or refining those camera positions once I, just, once I was happy with how we were going to block it. And then we'd film it. Now, filming it involved, um, no, there was no people uh, operating a camera, so there was no paraphernalia that you would normally see on a film set. Um, everything the actors looked at was 1943 in all four directions, north, south, east, west. They would believe everything they would they they were looking at. So they're not on a film set. They are in that space, in that world. And um, the uh, that what that means is that the people who are, uh, are looking after those cameras, the focus pullers, who are who are making sure that characters are in in focus as they move in and out of rooms and so on, up and downstairs. Um, are what all those cameras are wired through holes in the on the floor into the basement, and then there's you know wow. uh, five six focus pullers in the basement all day long waiting for that stuff to go on, and then that's their that's their function, and their the house is sort of umbilically linked uh, using all of the wiring that came up through the chimney essentially and uh, 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 all the way over the the prison wall to a shipping to a shipping container behind the wall. And in that shipping container, I, I was in there with Lucas Sahl, the cinematographer, Chris Oddy, the production designer, the DIT people who were recording all that information and so on, sound people, my translator. So it was like, a, uh, you know, it was like an OB, it was like an outside broadcast. It was like an event. It was like you're shooting an event rather than a movie. And um, the, 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 the effect is that uh, the actors are completely and utterly naturalistic because they're not looking or playing into any one or other lens they don't know what's filming them um and the effect gives the audience i think the opportunity to almost project themselves onto those characters mm -hmm. you sort of see how, it's almost like you know we're in those rooms and we're hidden away watching from a corner you know fly on the wall and we can just observe and it's in our observation i think that we begin to sort of analyze them you know Wow. Real quick follow, real quick follow up because uh, I, and I could have this wrong. And one of the featurettes that I saw used German lenses, Leica lenses, and, yeah, yeah. and and I find that interesting as well because also, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's a one seven eight aspect ratio, um, or, or, or like, I think I had that right. So I was just curious about if you could ratio choice and lens choices and how you narratively decide on that and how they play into your narrative. Well, it's one set. It's it, the the ratio is uh, sixteen nine, which I think is the same as one seven seven. But it's a um um, it's basically a sort of neutral frame. So it's almost a neutral frame. I didn't want to. I didn't want anything which was cinematic in the sense of, you know, for all the reasons I was avoiding all the kind of tropes and conventions of of cinema. Mm. I, I wanted a neutral canvas kind of thing. So sixteen nine is a very good format <clears throat> for that to achieve that, or at least as a starting point. Um. You know, so, um, so what's the second part of your question? So, well, the, 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 just the idea of your your the lens choice and then the aspect ratio and how those play into your narrative decisions. Right. Sorry. So yeah. So the cameras were extremely small cameras, and they were able because you know they have so that they're not big bulky cameras that the actors have to push past and maneuver past because <clears throat> so they're extremely small cameras. Uh, like I said, not operated, so they kind of either attached to the wall on on brackets or 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 a stands or hidden away in a cupboard or whatever um <clears throat> and those um and the lenses that we used uh was a, was it were like a lenses and they they're extremely sharp lenses everything all the choices really were to serve this idea of now it was happening it was happening we were witnessing something as it was happening mm. so there was no excuse me there was no i didn't want any kind of aesthetic uh uh barrier or sort of affectation to that i just wanted it to be as as absolutely like you were looking at it with 2020 vision unflinching mm. you know? um so really you're just looking for the right tools to achieve that sensation wow uh john i, I mean th this with the <laughs> utmost respect because i know that you are obviously nominated for best director but i think the oscar win i am cheering for and hoping for the most uh is your sound team uh, oh, just good. because that, I mean, the sound on this film is unlike anything I've ever experienced in a theater. And I'm sure Kevin would say the same. I'm sort of curious at what point in your process did you realize 
how important sound was going to be? Like, did you know when you put pen to paper, sound is going to be huge here? Or was it on on the set or was it in post when sound really became so crucial in this film? Well, you get to those um, uh, decisions sort of step by step. They don't all happen, of course, at once. And the first step was to um, for me to um, uh, kind of understand that I wanted to um, not show the not reenact the violence. And so um, I committed the all of the scenes I wrote were going on on the perpetrator side of the wall as opposed to on the prison camp side of the wall. The, the death camp side of the war. So, um, and once I made that decision, then of course I knew that the sounds that were going to be emanating from that side of the war would sort of bear down on everything we see. Yeah. Um, so I would say early in the process, mm -hmm. um, um, long before post-production um, and long be and before the shoot as well, long before the shoot. <laughs> and then there was just a series with Johnny Byrne and his sound team of, you know, gathering all these, sounds based on sort of field recordings so or rather using field recordings there aren't people going into booths and reenacting things it's it's really about uh, uh gathering real world sounds either that exist or that one needs to go and record with hidden microphones so let's say you're looking for german voices shouting because you wanted to hear the sound the idea of guards you know and you could hear them on the wind you know thank you from over um from over the wall um you know, I suppose conventionally what you'd do is you'd get a German sounding guy and you'd uh, put him in a microphone in a booth and you'd get him to shout and then you'd deal with the level of sound in the mix. Um, that would never satisfy me. I mean, I wouldn't want to start with that kind of fakery. So um, then you think, well, how do I get German people to shout without me asking them to? And then you think, OK, well, they play football on a Sunday afternoon like anywhere in Europe. And there's 22 guys you know, two teams of 11 guys shouting at each other and, 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 you know, as they're pick, kicking a ball around and, um, <laughs> and we go, you go there with microphones and you sit on the sideline and with microphones and you record it. And, and then you, and then you have a repository of, if you like German shouts, you know, <laughs> so that would be one layer of, uh, of, uh, what you need to work with. And they in one layer of, of hundreds. Um, wow. So it's just very resourceful uh, uh, use of uh, real world sound. Really, that's wild. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you is because you create an atmosphere with the sound in a way that is like it's so fascinating because you never really understand truly what you're hearing, but you're but you understand it in a way. As I, I, it kind of reminded me of what Fincher did with Seven, where he never shows mm. you the violence. And you just yeah. learn about it through the dialogue. And it's yeah. that much more horrifying when you don't see it because you ima yeah. what you're imagining is way more horrifying than what you could show us, I would argue. Um, and so I wanted to ask you about the mixture of score and sound design because your score and your sound design almost are married in a beautiful way that you almost can't differentiate at times because you're so immersed in it. And I just wanted to know if you – is is that blend – part of your your narrative storytelling do you want us to not be able to differentiate between the atmosphere of the music and and the surroundings sometimes i i think the um the blur of those um uh tools that one is, one uses are um you know is more interesting to sound is a very is, is interpretive you know in a way that pictures aren't you know when we see a picture we know what it is but, uh, you know instantly but when we hear a sound it's it we, we can interpret that sound in many different ways and of course, right. we tune so much stuff out. You, you guys look like you're both in pretty quiet offices. But, you know, if there's a fire, if, you know, if a fire engine was to go past, you'd hear it, but you wouldn't really think, oh, there's a fire engine. You just accept it. So it's a sort of, it's mm. a sort of, um, it's a layering up of all of those uh, um, real world sounds that are going on, you know. Um, mm. uh, it's not a, it's by no means um, a straightforward, uh, um, uh, intentionally um, vague, so that you may, not vague, but, is that a baby crying or is that a prisoner screaming? You know, um, mm. is that a train or is that a, what am I listening to here? What is that? Is that an industrial sound? What is that? And all we of lean things, in, we lean in more, we lean into the screen more when you do that. Precisely. And I think we have, we, we bring to the, you know, I think a lot of filmmakers underestimate what we bring to the audience, uh, to what we bring to the movies ourselves. Um, mm. the images we carry in us in our, in our minds of, for instance, in this subject of the Holocaust, um those sounds uh you have the images in your head you know what those images you know what's going on behind that wall 
And what you don't know or haven't seen, you can only imagine. So those are always going to be much more um, powerful than than anything that uh, I could or anyone I believe w- would be able to achieve um, by by filming it. What you're what you're showing here through sound is that is that is the abyss, and that cannot yeah. be filmed. If it's filmed, then it's not the abyss. It's a mm. it's kind of cosplay version of it. It's a uh, you know um it's never going to get to the depth that it needs to in order to affect you physically the way i i hope it does for people yeah well that's well that's yeah. perfectly leads into my next question because in terms of visuals every, there are so many things uh, in this film that are so subtle uh for everything that you show us there are 10 things that you don't they're still in our mind that we could still visualize but you never take the camera there i'm sort of curious as a storyteller how did you decide I'm going to show A, but I'm not going to show B through Z? Like, what was the difference between what you did want us to see and what you didn't want us to see? Do you have an example, a particular example that springs to mind? Uh, just to I mean, start. I mean, just in terms of, uh, you know, we see the the smoke pillowing on the other side of the wall. And just that image itself springs mm. to mind, to your point, 10,000 mm-hmm. other images that we've seen in history books and documentaries and other films. And mm-hmm. I love that you show that, but we don't really go that much further on the other side of the way, just because it doesn't really feel like we need to. And I'm just sort of curious, uh, was there ever a moment where you almost went any further than you ever did? I There were certainly moments in the scripting where I thought I was going to go over the other side, you know, and I think... Um... But I, I realized just through, through you know, process for me is always a process of sort of distillation. You're distilling something down, um, you know, so I'm trying to I start maximal. I start max with a maximum and I try and try and get to the minimum. And really, um, you can get to the minimum once you understand what your ingredients are and what they will achieve. So, for instance, uh, you know, in this context with the, with the, the chimney that was I can't remember how many meters away, it was like a, something like. I can't even remember. I don't want to put a figure on it, but it was um, the 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 real the chimney of crematorium one, which is the, see, the one you see at the end of their garden on the other side of their garden, is a direct simulation in distance to the house as the real chimney to the real house. So um, it was so close to their lives. It was so obvious what it was. Um, I wanted to just simply show that, and I think when you see. Uh, when you see that and when you hear the sounds of people in that wh- who are being led into gas chambers, you hear it, well, he's outside having a cigar one, one evening, you know, nice stroll in his garden after a, you know, birthday cake with his family. Um, oh. Like, you know, anyone might go out, well, you have family, you have dinner with your family. It's a lovely spring evening and summer evening. You're going to mm-hmm. pop outside and play with a dog or whatever you're going to do. It's just that. But, but the, so I think it's the, we know what that horror is. We know what that smoke is. I, I didn't, I didn't, I realized I didn't need to get any closer than we, than we do. I didn't believe I needed to get any closer. I thought that everything could be achieved from the distance we were witnessing it from. You stay I, subjective. It's important. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I agree with you hundred percent. I would like to follow up on something you said. You said initially in the scripting that you did go on the, how, can you, can you, uh, is, or is, were there specific scenes that you wrote and then cut? Were like, were there, were there, were there scenes that that featured uh, you know more of the other side? That, you know, because the story is about because we stay on the house with the house, we stay within the house and garden for the majority of the the the, the film. Um, you, as you're sort of, I'm sort of committing by deciding that that I'm only ever going to see him when he comes home mm-hmm. um, from work. You know, so it's like a you know, it's like a Douglas Sirk movie or something. You know, set in some American suburb mm-hmm. or something. Mm-hmm. Where you know, um, so so. He comes home from work and he hangs his hat up and he has dinner with his kids and chats with his wife and, you know, whatever, listens to the radio, reads his, reads a book, goes to bed. Um, mm. That's what he does. That's what we're watching. So it's uh, it's not a um, um, it's not very much like a uh, um, there aren't opportunities to see the other side of the wall. Put it like that. You can't you're not committed to staying on this side of the wall. So I can only ever see him coming back from it. So. I did have scenes before I'd made the decision that I couldn't, I simply couldn't uh, um, cross that line. That line became, um, you know, a very important uh, uh, barometer of, of, it's like, it's almost like you're making a film, you're sort of, sort of um, making a moral decision, really, about mm. what you can and can't show. Um, mm. 
And so, you know, those things just fell by the wayside. Once I realized I didn't, once I, 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 it's inevitable that when you first start writing, you think of all of it, you know, you're, you're, you're all over the shop with, with it. And, and bit by bit, like I said, through distilling, you end up really understanding what, what it is you're making. Um, and then getting rid of that stuff is easy. Um, yeah. Fascinating. You know, John, one thing I, I had a pretty profound moment. I remember watching the film walking out and then thinking that, I just watched an R-rated movie. And I remember looking at the thing going, wait, that was PG-13. Oh, was, I gotta be honest, I did not know that. Is it really? It blew my mind when I read that because yeah. when you think about it, it, it makes sense. There's, you know, you don't, there's no really yeah. truly visible brutality or violence. It's really yeah. all in your, you know, what you hear and see. I was just curious though, because I remember Jake, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't the conjuring rated R because it was almost like so just scary? Because it was scary. Yeah. There's no right. sex or and, violence or language. It's just because of how scary right. it is. Wow. So I wanted to ask you, did was there any at all issue with the MPA and kind of like getting a PG-13 rating? Because I just, what I experienced felt like an R-rated movie, if that if that makes sense. I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Uh, do you know, I I, I agree. I, I remember being quite shocked myself when I saw the rating of the film. I was just thinking, really, is that, how's that? Okay. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, I can't, I don't know, maybe people will take, uh, you know, maybe kids will go and see this film. I think I'm, I'm, I'm surprised by it, like you like you were. Yeah. <laughs> because it because you know it has a psychological effect and and oh. uh you know so yeah i don't i don't anyway i'm not i'm not going to uh, argue with the rating i'm you know, <laughs> yeah they change it tomorrow yeah. you're like what what just <laughs> happened all right uh, i'll get you out of here on this last question because there's a uh, there's a quote that i keep seeing like kind of in the featurettes as well which is that the film is a reflection of ourselves in a way and kind of in terms of modern times and you, you know when you're watching this film you do think about how we think about the world. I mean, obviously this is a very specific situation, but it does have a lot of timely elements that we can compare it to. Um, and I was just curious what reflection on your own self you found. Um, I know to Jake's question about the idea of, uh, of a film, your own film haunting you, but I'm actually more curious about the reflection you found, how it's how it's changed your own perception of the world, how you walk through life differently now. How, how, what reflection did you find in yourself? Well, I think, um, you know, uh, somebody uh, uh, said uh, a little while ago to me, um, you know, it makes you wonder, like, what's over my wall, you know, um, mm. which I thought was a very interesting way of looking at it in a very particular way that's also yeah. a very universal way. And so uh, I think, it, you know, it's as we know, you know, the comforts that we enjoy in, in the safety and security of the societies we live in um, are do not come without a cost to others. Um mm. And it's looking at that really, I think. And so um, I look at it myself. Of course, I'm. I'm. Um, I mean, I'm. I'm mindful of it, in the sense that it it led me to make a film about it. Um, so I'm. You know, I'm just. I'm conscious of the. Uh, forever conscious of the. Um, you know, gross kind of uh, um, inequality of resource and and uh, uh, you know in the world and. Um, and the and the fact that people are killing each other for them for those resources and everything that stems from it it's 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 so abominable it it just feels to me that um, to talk to us to talk to try and make something from a particular you, individual point of view um, that those are the things that can foster change I think I don't mean I'm going to change anything with the film but I hope it's part of the dialogue of of, of change which is um, really to be um, to be able to uh, self-examine really to be able to look at ourselves and be honest with ourselves about what we choose to empathize with and what we choose not to um mm. you know which which uh human beings are more important to us than others and for why so it's sort of there's all those questions in it i think but um mm. uh you know people like i said i think i hope people come at it from a physical their experience is a physical first feeling you know mm. um they don't need to be uh, history majors to to uh, get anything out of this film far from it i think it's a human it's a human film before it's uh, yeah. anything else well john i just want to say thank you for joining our show um this has been a profound honor to have you on uh, i ever since seeing your film i've been telling every single person i've known to watch it um it is an extraordinary uh, piece of filmmaking and you i've never seen anything like this in the years that i've been watching cinema thank you for joining our show we really appreciate it Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Jay. I appreciate it, too. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. Have Good a great day. We want to thank our good friends at A24 and also Jonathan Glazer for joining us. 
for this show. Gabe, can you look up real fast the sure. best director nominees and yeah, who yeah. we managed to get this year? Yeah, yeah. Give me just a moment. I can tell you right now. I think we came really close. Just came close to for a Anatomy suite. of the Fall. We had. Here, I've, um, got, I've got it right here. We uh, haven't had Justine though on the show, have we? I don't think. I don't think Justine was got a. Oh no, Justine nomination. got a screenplay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, no, Anatomy of Fall. Okay, here we go. I got you, boys. I looked it up as yes. Uh, Justine for Anatomy of a Fall. Scorsese for Killers of the Flower Moon. Nolan okay. for Oppenheimer. Uh, Poor Things or Yorgos for Poor Things and Glazer for um, Zone okay. of Interest. So, so three, three of, of the five. Mars Scorsese ever elusive. Um, <laughs> yes and i think we, on the anatomy of a list. fall is the kind of movie that m- maybe we'd have an opportunity to come back around it's one i think that we they just did a um small press day that i think yeah. Kevin and i did uh last week mm-hmm. um but yeah they're just but, they're just kind of you know but they've probably been doing press since since the can exactly Festival last year yeah. but i found this really interesting though because for all the talk about uh greta gerwig getting in, not getting in when people are talking about the nominations as they came out. One of the one of the names that everybody kind of circled as saying like, oh no, they're in. It was Glazer. It was Jonathan yeah. Glazer. And it was for the power and the impact of of this film. Um and also his I mean he's a respected filmmaker. Mm-hmm. His his film's previous birth, uh Sexy Beast. Oh, I think sexy beast. after um Into the Skin, you know, under the I skin. think that really under, under the skin. skin um Put him on a, a which ton I was of not people's a, radars. Which I was not a fan of. That's really the oh only God, movie he's done. I that really? Did, see, did I not loved for that movie. Loved it. Anyway, uh, Jakey, what was, what was your takeaway? I mean, I think we all know that this is a really difficult film to sit through. But uh, what's your takeaway on the film and, and having spoken to Jonathan about it? Um, one, I was very grateful to, to have this conversation. We talk a lot about, you know, when we often complain about the the four minute junket circuit of which we're all a part of and and the main one of the main reasons we created the show being to sort of break that that concept and have these in-depth uh conversations um this is exactly the type of movie that i think is is uh, perfectly exemplifies why we created the show in the first place in that we often talk about how did people do a junket for Schindler's List? Now, granted, when they did junkets back in 93, 30 plus years ago, they got more time than we do today. But the concept of squeezing in a quick conversation about something like Schindler's List seems impossible. And the same concept goes here uh, for Zone of Interest, this idea of trying to have a quick conversation um, about about this topic uh, is just impossible. So I was very grateful to sort of have the in-depth conversation that we had. Um, that being said, uh, I mean, look, it's, it, it's a remarkable film that, and I think Kevin and I will, will both say this, uh, that we'll never see again. I, I will never watch this movie. You know, it's, it's uh, the Holocaust, World War II, uh, it, it's, a, it's a, a topic that has been uh, approached in, in so many different ways and so many different angles by different filmmakers. Um, World War II just in general, but specifically when it comes to the Holocaust. Um, th- I felt like I'd never really seen a Holocaust movie like this before in that it almost is uh, a better example of the evil that surrounded the Holocaust by not showing you the evil, by showing you uh, people's capability of going about their everyday life, that that things Mm -hmm. could be almost, uh, you know, this, this isn't meant to be like a disrespectful comparison, but like the fact that these people uh, the, this, 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 you know, Nazi commander and his family were able to live what sort of feels like a leave it to beaver style existence, uh, you know, in a quaint little house where mom and the, and the kids wait for dad to come home at the end of the day, except dad was, uh, you know, a, a, a commandant at, at a, at a concentration camp at Auschwitz. Um, and to me, that almost is hard. That, that, it's impossible for me to wrap my brain around. You know, right. and, and there are so many subtleties in the movie that hit you like a sledgehammer once you, you know, because there, there will be moments where it's telling you something. And at least for me, it may have taken me like 15 to 20 seconds to go, oh, shit, that's what, you know, there's a moment where um, Sandra Huller, the great Sandra Huller, who is also in Anatomy of a Fall, um, she plays uh, the, the commander's wife. And there are moments where she's trying on uh, jackets and coats at the beginning of the film. And about 20 seconds into this shot, you realize, oh, 
those were clothes taken from oh, wow. uh, uh, the Jewish men and women and children who were taken into these concentrations. And, and she's trying them on like she's at Macy's. And just the subtleties of those moments where it doesn't beat you over the head with what it's trying to say. It gives you a moment to, to sort of play catch up and, and realize what's happening here. And I feel like that sort of moment is a, is a microcosm example of, of why this movie works. It's incredibly subtle. Uh, there's so much more. I mean, Kevin blew my mind in the interview by uh, pointing out that the film is PG-13. Because yeah. if you had asked me, I would have said, no, this is a hard R. But then he makes you, Kevin brilliantly said, but okay, but what is it that you actually see? And you're right. You don't really see, I mean, you see a pillowing of smoke on the other side, of, coming from the other side of a wall. But because of your knowledge of history and because of your knowledge of what happened on the other side of that wall, your imagination starts running laps and it everything that you imagine is is far more hor horrible than anything that's ever been on the screen and to me that's just the brilliance of what glazer does here and, and an example of why he i think he very much earned one of the five best director slots because he uses uh you know three words to tell a novel's worth of story um mm -hmm. you know we, this the, the holocaust has never really kind of been told from this perspective before um and and look at the end of the day you know, this is a topic that the more education you can get out there, the better, the more people uh, know about this from, from every possible angle. But, you know, the, in terms of uh, a, a cinematic representation of evil, the fact that, you know, this family was able to live just a, you know, a, a quaint sense of, of repetition over and over again on the, with a shared wall of a concentration camp is one of the most shocking uh, examples of evil I think I've ever seen uh, on the big screen before. So uh, we'll never see it again. Respect it uh, beyond measure, uh, beyond honor to, to have had uh, Glazer on the show. But man, what a what a watch. I think, and to what Jake talks about, I think what's so horrifying about the film is it's so shocking that you can't comprehend it. Mm -hmm. Like it's almost, it's completely incomprehensible um, in the sense of how, like the subtlety and the nuance of how we're living in this house with this family and a husband and wife are having an argument about a husband having to work too much and having to travel for work. And by travel, he means going to other concentration camps. So you're sitting in the middle of a husband and wife arguing that you would see like like Jake's talking about in any other type of genre where like husbands and wives argue, but the argument is surrounding the most horrifying topic you can think of. Like it, it is so, I mean, there's obviously so many other horrifying things in the world, but this particular aspect of things, that's what's so shocking to me is the, it was, uh, is the right word to use here, Jake compliance, like the family, the kids sure. and like everybody just kind of, it was as if they thought that this was the way the world should be. And we are just living in their home as they just continue living this life with this mindset and he's doing this job, which is killing millions of people. And it is, I don't know, on a personal note, my mom's Jewish, my, my entire side of my mom's family is Jewish. And when I was a kid, I remember they took me to the Holocaust Museum and I can still see my, for some reason it's an outer body memory for me when I walked down the halls and in, in, have you guys been before with, mm -hmm. uh, with, with in the DC? shoes? Yeah. The shoes. Yeah, all right. So there's a, there's an area where there's all these shoes from the Holocaust behind glass. And it's just, it feels like thousands of shoes of people's people who died. And it's just, mm. I'll never forget as a kid seeing that. And it was part of the reason why I waited till I was 38 to watch Schindler's list. Um, I have a, it, 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 going to the Holocaust Museum as a kid was, was one of the most horrifying experiences I've ever had. Um, because when you see it for real, like when you see these shoes in person or you, sh you're hearing these stories, it is, it's beyond comprehension. But as Jake said, World War II and the Holocaust has been covered uh, many times in cinema over the years. And we, we, and it's something that we are, we are we seem to understand through cinema. And then when, even though it's, it will never be understood, but when you watch a film like this, it brings such a unique perspective to it that it, it like, like Jonathan says in the interview, it gave, like it gives you a stomach ache. It makes you feel, it turns your stomach in a way that like, we can't imagine the horrors 
that were happening on the other side of that wall. And Jake, uh, we talk about sound design. This is one of the big talkers for this movie, and it should be. Um, the sound design in this film, there's, like the Jonathan has talked about this, like there's two movies happening. There's the visual film, and then there's the sound film. And uh, Jake, I brought this up in the interview as well, and I think John Jonathan responded to it. Like, and, and and again, the comparison was not at all in the sense of like I'm not saying like these movies are are like this, but the idea of like Fincher withholding the violence in seven and then we learn about it through dialogue or like for Oppenheimer for example when we don't go to Hiroshima and Nagasaki we just look at Killian's face and how he's processing it the reason I use those comparisons is because it's what you don't see that is so much more horrifying what we imagine is way worse than what could ever be filmed and that's what I believe Jonathan was going for here because by not entering the Auschwitz camp and just hearing the sounds and the visuals of the smoke and the screams and the gunshots and the horrifying things you're hearing while this family is having a normal, quote unquote, normal being of existence somehow. Like you have a father reading his daughter nighttime stories out her window is the fire and the smoke from Auschwitz and the screaming. And it's as well, if so there's nothing going on. It doesn't. It's so let disturbing. Me on, I can't it. explain it. Yeah. Let me ask a question. Um, I haven't seen it yet. I, I need to press play on it before the Oscars. I, I plan to. It's the difficult subject matter. But yeah. um, Jakey, let me go to you on this one. Wh how, how come he's included in the best director conversation? It, like what what is it about the is it the um, restraint? Do you think? Uh, like do you what, mind what if I step show? in? Do you mind if I step uh, in for this real quick? Sure. Do you know how he shot it, Sean? No, I have no. OK, so I think at any given time there was 10 cameras rolling and the house. And this is this has been talked about in the interview um, a bit. But in the house, they set up cameras all over the house. Some of them were visible to the actors. Some of them were not. Um, and I, I, I Jonathan Glazer, I'm going to quote him on this. He used the term big brother. And what he meant by that is. The, the filmmakers are outside the house, like in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a tent of some sort, watching all the monitors of all the 10 cameras or so they have set up. Mm -hmm. There's I don't believe there was anybody in the house except for the actors. And so you had the rig. So everything was done almost docu style. Interesting. And the, the way that Jonathan talks about it is he wanted to create present tense in the past. So you're not watching something from the past. You're being dropped into the moment. So everything's filmed like he even they say this in the featurette. They use German lenses like a lenses. And these are not super glamorizing lenses. And like Jonathan talks about this a lot as well. And because uh, I've watched a lot of him uh, discussing this stuff. Cinema generally glamorizes things when you when you sh when you shoot a story or you make a movie there's a, there's a certain level of glamour that comes with cinematic glamour in terms of all mm -hmm. storytelling and film and he wanted to get away from that it's probably i think the term bleak is a great term to use for a film like this uh jake i would argue because it's just it's it's so subtle and nuanced and so to answer your question about why he deserves the best director nomination Everything we just said about the sound design and the approach to shooting this film. And I said this to, to Jonathan Glazer, I'm five weeks into seeing this film and I still wake up thinking about it. Like, and, and, and that's not an exaggeration. I'm not trying to sound like, uh, you know, I'm over the top. I've never seen anything like this before. And I cannot believe it's just shocking. It, makes, it almost makes me want to cry. I, I cannot explain to you how horrifying this film is. Okay. But I but it's but it's necessary. And I want to make that point. That's very important to me. Like everything we're saying, it might sound like don't go see this. No, you need this perspective because it's not only the past we're looking at here, but it's also we're looking, as he says, at ourselves in modern day and how and what we decide to walk past and and not think about or not do anything about um yeah I, it's right. yeah oh well, jake real quick though just don't don't, don't you think he deserve best director oh yeah yeah you know it's, it's so funny it's, you know especially in in journalism you know so often this idea of um you know getting you know you gotta get both sides of the story you know whatever every yeah. story you gotta and you know it's just so like well not all not all stories because guess what you know the the other side of of the holocaust perspective 
it's still they're still wrong. There is no other there is no other side. This this is the other side. This is literally the other side of the wall. And guess what? It's just as bad and evil, if not more so. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, Glazer's ability to to um, bring a, a new uh, viewpoint and a new perspective um, into uh, a moment in history that, uh, you know, we we need to know and, and do know very well. And it, the way he's able to tell it in a way that I've never really seen uh, it told before, uh, I think, yeah, it, to me, it's it's the very definition of, um, you know, why a, a person earns a, a Best Director nomination. The Zone of Interest is in theaters as we speak, and um, it is contending for multiple Oscars. And we want to thank, again, Jonathan Glazer for coming on the show to discuss his film. Let's take a quick break and um, we'll reconvene on the other side. And we are back. All right. So there's a news item that we want to touch on because um, Gareth Edwards is a friend of the show. We are fans in general of the Jurassic Park franchise. Uh, and I'm going to go to Jakey on this one because... A loose are general, we? Jake. A loose are we? general. <laughs> uh, Jake loves the Jurassic Park films. Not so much the Jurassic World films. Two the Jurassic films. Park films. Um, and now we're hearing that they're going to continue Jurassic World. And Gareth Edwards is coming on board. It has a release date, quote unquote, of July 2nd, 2025. I'm not quite sure how that's going to happen. Uh, and we're excited because David Kep is writing it. Jake, on Yo. a scale of one to ten, where does this new news uh, put you in terms of your excitement it, about the revival of the Jurassic franchise. It, it makes no logical sense. I'm I'm like that. The I'm like um, Charlie Brown with a football. Like I just yeah. keep getting fooled over and over again because I have not liked a Jurassic movie since Steven Spielberg directed them. I Jurassic Park right. is one of my all-time favorite movies. I love The Lost World. I think it is an incredible sequel. Um, there are some great moments in that. And at that point is when I stopped liking them. I don't like Jurassic Park 3 and I don't like any of the Jurassic Worlds. I thought they all sucked. Um, that being Jurassic said, World is good. No, it's not. It's not it's good. A good. It is not a good movie. It's very um, fun. It is. It's a. It's a. Hmm. Um, but I. <laughs> that being said, every time they announce new Jurassic news, I'm like, okay, I'm in. I'm in. You know. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't like the idea of a rushed Jurassic movie. Um, hmm. That that concerns me. Um, David kept coming back to write is is always a step in the right direction, and obviously Gareth, Gareth Edwards, you know we we've seen what he can do with with Rogue One, obviously the creator, um, you know the the way he handled and utilized uh, special effects uh, in the creator and in, uh, in Rogue One as well um, gives me a lot of hope. I, I one of the things I, I remember loving about Rogue One is uh, his making it feel like an original Star Wars. You know it, mm. it's that was always sort of my issue with. Um, Ridley Scott's uh, Alien prequels is that all the technology that, that they had in their ships looked better than the technology that the characters had in the years to come in the you know in the original Alien film. Um, so they you know so he I like that he matched. I'm hoping that he sort of gives us a match for for that original film. But um, but I gotta be honest with you, that Jurassic Park video game that's coming out is the most mm. excited and I think the the best idea for a Jurassic anything since the lost world this well, idea it puts you on the island during the yeah, first movie well, it, it takes place the the day after jurassic park and the idea okay. is that everyone's been evacuated except for one person from from the company got left behind accidentally okay. so you know and i don't know if so you it saw seems the like it's gonna be like a survival survival yeah it's a survival thing at, at yeah. one point you know she she runs is by that the person arnold paddock. schwarzenegger oh it should be but, like, then I'm but it's in. like little things it's like uh you know the 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 velociraptor is still in the freezer from the kitchen, you know that okay. she, run, she runs by the Tyrannosaur paddock, and and uh, you know Alan you know, Alan Grant's hat is still on the ground from being blown off by the T Rex. Like all those. Jake, okay. like, are there are there people still holding onto their butts on the island as well? That's the secret <laughs> in Jurassic Heaven. You always hold on yep. to your butts. If you if you stop, you lose an arm. Yeah, yeah, ex yeah exactly right. <laughs> Keep your hands on your butt. <laughs> you know this this series and franchise hasn't given me a reason to have hope in. 25 years um and un until i see something that convinces me otherwise i, I don't right. know a couple other facts about this david leach and kelly mccormick are still producing uh after talks with david leach to direct fell through there is no uh, a new storyline though no indication if any previous cast members will be joining all this is via variety 
which had the story. I'm done with the I'm done with the original cast members participating. I don't oh, I don't yeah. need well, that. I mean, we saw what happened so last. I mean, it, it added nothing. No, it was nothing. bugs. It was a movie about freaking bugs. I'm, so would go you in a different direction, Jake? Go. If they just did this video game, would you want them to just be like on a helicopter leaving at the very beginning of the movie? Like, would you just want even that? that's what it should be? <laughs> yeah. Th- that's actually really funny. If the opening graphic is the helicopter leaving and this one woman is waving. <laughs> wait, wait, I'm still here kind of thing. So I, I'm, I'm, starting to, I'm starting to feel like Jurassic, like I'm feeling about the Ghostbusters franchise. They just I, 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 I like the last Ghostbusters movie. I think, I think that Ghostbusters is going in a good direction. This new one looks like it's 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 I, less establishing the Ghostbusters, which they had to do for a new generation, and more telling stories with Ghostbusters involved, right. like I like just, kind of mission like stories. The, I didn't like the forcing of the original cast. Yeah, like I, I I had a problem with the way the Harold Ramis thing was handled. I didn't. Oh, like that's terrible. That. Oh, interesting. I, interesting. I, 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 I like actually kind of liked it. See, I I, like I, it just felt a little. I, I don't know. It, it didn't. As much as beautiful as that moment seems on paper, I don't think it worked in the movie. Um, I guess the reason I'm comparing these two is because they're both long running franchises. They're both franchises that have brought back OG characters. And I don't think have done, in my personal opinion, done well with those OG characters in the return, especially in the. I actually liked Paul Feig's film. I just didn't think the OG characters needed to be in that movie. Um, no, and they so were bad. What's, what's interesting to me about. This this uh, Jurassic thing. Well, I said I said you guys and listen. Ghostbusters is one of my favorite movies of all time. I mean, this is you know I have a very nostalgic feeling about those two those first two movies um, that Ivan Reitman did. But also I, I gotta say one of the proudest things that we I've ever had have been a part of on this show was when we were able to have Jason and Ivan. Reitman yeah. On. Oh my God, um, I forgot about and, that. What a flashback. If you that go back great. and watch this, it's so cool because you have father and son. Obviously, Ivan mm-hmm. passed. And we're talking um, about Ghostbusters. Like, yeah, it, 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 yeah, yeah. We, we often oh. talk about like, you know, sometimes yeah. getting them for a different movie and having to right. shoehorn in the questions we really want to ask. We right. got him for a Ghostbusters And, and we got movie. Jason talking about like growing up on yes. set like oh, that. Like it was just kind of the Oh per- my God, you really want to go back and listen to that episode. Dude, hearing them talk about how they shot the egg thing practically when the egg starts yeah, frying yeah, yeah. on the counter. Like... Um, that was one of my favorite interviews we ever did on our show because if you go back and I was showing it to someone the other day because we were, were putting together a promo for this Ghostbusters thing we're trying to do for because the new one's coming out and there's a Ghostbusters club that it's whatever it's minutia but there were I was showing my buddy the interview we did with Ivan and Jason I'm like wow I forgot that we had both of them it wasn't even the father wow. something because didn't didn't Ivan Reitman end up passing like months later or was it like shortly after yeah, was, yeah it was not too long it was yeah. very shortly after and i remember like that was such yep. a special thing to ha- and they were sitting right next to each other you had this generation of a father who passes movie down to his son anyways the point i'm making is like with jurassic um i don't love the way the new ones have been handled but yesterday when we were texting i said now you have my attention because gareth Makes yeah, me excited exactly. to see it because I think that Gareth's going to bring like what we saw with the creator, what we saw with Rogue One, Rogue One. Actually, I'm sorry if you already made this point, but Rogue One was handled beautifully, right, mm-hmm. by Gareth. And that was a continuation or a part of this larger Star Wars world. And I think there's been, you know, we've been getting a little fatigued by it, but he brought a, a special, interesting look to it that I thought was fascinating. The end of that movie is well, remarkable. Some will yeah. argue that a lot of that movie is Tony Gilroy, though. Sure. I understand, yeah, but, but I felt but, a lot of Rogue One in Creator. I feel like he yeah. he proved to me that he his fingerprints are on Rogue One sure. by okay. what I saw in the Creator. But then here's the secret to this Jurassic movie. Give him $60 million. Yes. Low budget. Give him sixty yeah. million yes. and have him yes. do a Jurassic movie. I don't do want a two hundred and fifty million dollar Jurassic movie. I agree you know? with you. And, and go back, go back to that middle ground. I know that J. A. Uh, J. A. Is it Bayona, um, Bayona who did Fallen Kingdom um, and Colin. I know, I know that there was a lot of talk about the animatronics and practical effects of the new ones. But what makes the original Jurassic Park so brilliant is the marriage of CG and practical and based on the limitations of CG back then necessity is the mother of invention you know the T-Rex running shot is works because you start with the practical ten, you know thousands of pounds animatronic T-Rex and then you cut to the CG running yep. because it's raining and because it's dark you've already set that in place in your mind it's, it's wishful cool. thinking though because it's still a giant studio that's going to have to make the call about where the budget goes sure. so it's it's a it, maybe 
But well, I, if I it's a $60 million was, dollar thing, then maybe if they can get it in there. I want to say, the though, fa- a tease hmm. for something to come in the coming weeks. Uh, mentioning uh, Tony Gilroy, excellent. Andor is great. And clearly, you see you see Rogue One in Andor, uh, uh, clearly. But coming up, we have the cinematographer of Rogue One at some point will be on the show and told us that the best scene in Rogue One was Gareth Edwards deciding to to change that scene to the uh, to what it was. I'll just say that. So, I mean, fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. That's a good tease. I'll say one more quick thing um, just about like because I think Sean has a brilliant point here, because what do you have to lose? Go low. I mean, the, the higher budget ones, I know they made a lot of money, but they but they weren't well received. I think we need more information and, before. I mean, it's right now it's we love the idea of a tight movie on a tight budget. Yes. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that he can't take a hundred million dollars and turn it into a a great movie. Like, I think I think that I think he's done enough on every scale to show yeah. that he understands how to use his budget. And I think that's all yeah. I need. It's not just him, though. Like, if you take a look at box offices like movies are not making what they used to make sure like i was looking at box office uh, this past weekend and looking at films that get to like 70 80 you know now if you can get over 100 it's kind of a win yeah like the the scale is gonna have to balance where the studios are spending less yeah to make profit yeah you you shouldn't have to make a billion dollars to break look like i know I know, you know, the Mission Impossible uh, budget was inflated because of all the COVID shutdowns. But like sure. the fact that that movie made 650, almost 700 million dollars and was deemed a financial uh, disappointment is right. unbelievable to me. Like, like, like 700 million dollars should be great. It's a crazy for an business movie. strategy. Too. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this idea of these these 300, 350 million dollar movies needing to make a billion dollars to even start being in the conversation of whether or not it was successful. It's not, you know, like it's, it's, I mean, we were, we, we were in a bubble where, you know, yeah, we had that, what, that one year where Disney had like, what, like eight or nine movies cross the billion dollar mark. And right. for some reason, Hollywood thought that's life from here on out, instead of looking yeah. at it like the anomaly that it was. Right. They took exactly. it as, as the rule and it's not like we're now at a point where like, what, what last year, what we had $3 billion, like we had Barbie, um, almost Oppenheimer and Mario. So what? Two yeah. two, two billion yeah. dollar movie. But, like that, that, no, that's probably going to be life moving forward. There's no reason why Oppenheimer should cost a hundred million dollars and Jurassic should cost two hundred fifty million to three hundred million dollars in terms of budget. I think like these budgets are so inflated. So I'm uh, I'm watching a lot of Masterclass right now. Have you guys ever oh, seen cool. the Masterclass? Yeah. Series? Fantastic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Have and, you seen which ones yeah. have you seen so far? Sorry. So right, um, I just finished James Cameron. Have you seen? Okay, you I, have, I haven't seen that one. I recommend Ron Howard's one of the. Yes. Oh, cool. Have you seen it? I know the that's, Ron the, that, one? that's one you of should, the ones I want to watch. He's one of the you should, yeah. you should guys cue that, that up right? soon. It's one of I the will. most. Um, just enlightening discussions on filmmaking, right. and he does, I think, a really great job of structuring that. Where course. are these for people who want to find them? It's an app, like it's called Masterclass, and mm-hmm. you pay oh. like a year yearly prescri- subscription. What I do, which I think is kind of cool, you can put it on your Apple TV. So nice. I sit in my apartment and I get a notepad out and I watch. And the reason I bring it up is because going back to Sean's point, the the lower your budget is, the more it forces you to make decisions that are going to keep your audiences immersed in the in the project. I'll give a very quick example. There's a scene in the first Terminator where Arnold sits down at a desk and he puts his arm down and he's about to cut his arm open and examine um, the inside of his arm. Like like it happens in T2 as well, but not to this extent. One of the coolest scenes as a kid right. to watch. Incredible. So uh, Cameron talks about how why that scene works, because when you set the audience up initially with a real thing, they will then take your mindset will then subconsciously compute it and add it into reality when it turns fake. And that's why I'm talking about the Jurassic Park T-Rex thing, because when you when you start with Stan Winston and that thousands of pounds T-Rex for real animatronically moving and then you cut to a CG T-Rex running your brain, it almost like computes. There's also a Mm-hmm. There's also the sorry, I don't mean, but there's also the no. way that you use it, which I think Gareth Edwards with his background right. of VFX is going to give his VFX the best opportunity to shine. It's the right. exact reason why the T-Rex in Jurassic Park was also always lit at night for the most mm-hmm. part versus daytime shots and these giant wide shots and all this stuff. If you yeah. look at Pacific Rim, the first one, 
was at night and underwater and was dark and it, and it lent itself to that. But then you go to Pacific Rim 2, which I enjoyed, a fun movie, but it turned into a Transformers movie because it was all mm-hmm. during the day. And so it just doesn't it's, it's knowing how to use the effects that you have, regardless of, of whether they're practical or not. Well, that's the point I'm making is like like in the so back real quick to the Cameron thing in the scene, Arnold sits down for real. And you see him go over, put the arm down, grab the knife. And then the next shot is the fake arm being opened and examined because your subconscious in that moment computes that you saw Arnold sit down and then you see the fake arm. Sure. You don't think about it. And so there the reason I'm it's a long way of saying, like, to Sean's point, that's what makes me excited. If they go back to that mindset with Jurassic, you can bring that magic back again. And the problem is these inflated budgets and this, the, all the CG and not really paying attention to the practical, you, you're losing your audience. We're not saying CG is bad. We're saying use it more smartly uh, as a filmmaker. And there are ways to do it going back to the old days of filmmaking. And that's why those things still are, are, are great to this day. That's why I still stand by my pitch that I made on this show a year plus ago. R rated Jurassic Park. Michael Crichton's mm. original novels are hard are stories if yeah. you adapt that book pay, and, and there's a there's enough differences like john hammond is, is kind of a dick in oh, the yeah. books it, there's enough differences between the books and the movie where it wouldn't even be a quote-unquote remake if you if you were to make michael crichton's jurassic park and adapt it page for page and you give people this really badass R-rated Jurassic Park movie. I mean, just picture it, like the Jurassic Park logo and all the letters fade away except for the R. I'm telling <laughs> you, you, guys are missing out. you guys are missing out on, on the natural conclusion of this right now. April 4th, 2025, Fast 11. July Ooh. 2nd, 2025, the crossover. <laughs> Dom versus... <laughs> A T-Rex. A T-Rex. You know that exists. Life you know that exists. Hang on. You know that exists. There's a video game. There's a video game called Ark Survival, Sponsored which by is Corona. no. It's a video game called Ark Survival, which is like a survival game where you you have to gather resources and all this stuff. Its sort of spin on the genre is that it takes place with dinosaurs, and so you have to fight and tame and and live around dinosaurs. And they. I don't think it's out yet. I think they announced it like two years ago with, but they had him 3D modeled. They added Vin Diesel to the game because he loves the game so much. No. <laughs> so it, it exists. Amazing. It exists. <laughs> That's so oh, sweet. Wow. Uh, we, All right. Yeah. So we're going to wrap up episode 299. Uh, we'll be back next week with a very exciting episode number 300. A milestone, a milestone episode for the Real Blend podcast, which started as an award show. <laughs> Uh, your comments uh, down below should be, does Gareth Edwards and, and David Kep involved in Jurassic have you interested in the franchise yet again? I want to hear your guys' opinion. Which I don't know if we explicitly said David Kep is the original writer of Jurassic Park. Yeah. In case yes, sorry. Some people yes. Yes. Yeah, no, just... and, and David Kep came on the show? He did, he did. Yeah. It was for an anniversary, right? Yeah, because we, because um, I asked him about, Look. I wanted to know about that, um, the the river sequence that was cut out of Jurassic Park. He gave us some real. Uh, I'll I'll uh, yeah. uh, drop it in as well to uh, a link. I it. actually think we had him on for a directorial effort. He wrote a, right? he wrote a, a movie with Kevin Bacon. He directed a horror yes. movie with Kevin Bacon. He he didn't do Freaky, did he? Like you don't tell no. about the no. that was Christopher that's, Landon. Yeah, that's the guy who was going to do Scream. The new Scream. You should have left. Should've was left. the yeah. You should have. Oh, okay. David Kep also wrote the first Spider-Man movie, by the way. See, that's what happens when we do 300 episodes. We forget all the amazing we guests. We we, that we, we have the had expression we use a lot, and it sounds far dickish than I intended, but like we have forgotten about more stuff than most people ever do. Yeah. It sounds really dickish. You are correct. It sounds super dickish. <laughs> ah, so follow great us on social Jake. media for more insight like that. <laughs> at Jake's Takes, at Kevin McCarthy TV, at Sean underscore O'Connell, at Gabe Kobach. And the show, as it has been for 300 episodes, is at Real Blend. We'll talk to you guys next week. And I guess we're still saying, Denis, tunes. tunes.